Gus Malzahn, who takes over an Auburn program that suffered a precipitous fall from glory in 2012, finishing 3-9 and 0-8 and in the SEC. That fresh start begins today. It's the Auburn A-Day game next on CSS. It is a spectacular Saturday afternoon on the Plains. It's the 2013 Auburn A-Day game presented by Cook's Pest Control live from Jordan-Hare Stadium as the Tigers lift the curtain on Gus Malzahn's first season as the new Auburn head coach. And good afternoon. I'm joined by former Auburn quarterback Ben Leard and Ben. That's the big story. Gus Malzahn is now the new head coach, the offensive coordinator on the 2010 National Championship team replaces Gene Chizik. The no huddle, hurry up offense, so successful just two seasons ago. What are you expecting from Gus Malzahn's team today? I think the number one dynamic you're going to see from this entire football team, what Coach Malzahn expects is ultimate discipline. Because in order for them to operate under the type of tempo, offensively, defensively, and special teams, they've got to be disciplined on every asset of the game. The other big storyline is the quarterback battle. Kyle Frazier started the first five games a year ago, was benched. Jonathan Wallace started the final four games. This quarterback battle will continue into the summer. Nick Marshall and Jeremy Johnson will come in. They'll be a part of that battle as well. But what are you looking for from those two guys today? Well, between Wallace and Frazier, you want one of those guys to separate themselves because the battle is going to perpetuate into fall camp and throughout the summer when the two newcomers come on campus. But execution, the execution in in and out of the huddle on the sidelines and leadership is what you want one of those two guys to do. Defensively, veteran Ellis Johnson has been brought in as the coordinator on Gus Malzahn's staff brings with him a 4-2-5 defense. The five in that defense is the star backer manned by Justin Garrett. They need a big season from him this year to make that defense work. You hope that Justin Garrett's the unsung hero, a guy that can play inside, outside, fill the alleys on the speed sweeps and things. Justin Garrett has had a tremendous spring practice, and they hope that continues on into the fall. It's the 2013 Auburn A-Day game. Later on today, they will roll the Tumors Corner Oaks for a final time. We'll have more on that story and the opening kickoff coming up next. The Auburn A-Day game is brought to you by Cook's Pest Control. Upgrade your home's termite protection to the unbeatable combination Cook's Pest Control and the Centricon system. Call Cook's for a free pest and termite evaluation. And by Third Shift Amber Lager. When beer is your calling, you never clock out. And here come the Auburn Tigers for the first time under new head coach Gus Malzahn as we're getting ready to kick off the Auburn A-Day game here at Jordan-Hare Stadium. The third member of our broadcast team is Emily Gagnon. She's down on the sideline, actually standing in the end zone. Emily? Hey, guys, it's a new day here on the Plains as the Gus Malzahn era begins. But today's AJ game is more about the past rather than the present. After the game, the oak trees at Tumor's Corner will get rolled in toilet paper one final time before being taken down. Now, I got this roll of toilet paper from a fan, and it says one last time on it. It's a celebration after the game. Coaches, players, and fans will be there. Those trees will get rolled until they can't get rolled anymore. And just as it's a new era on the football field, it'll also be a new era at Tumor's Corner. New trees will be planted, so one of the best traditions in college football will roll on. Thank you, Emily. We'll be checking in with Emily throughout the course of the ball game, and that really has been the mantra of Gus Malzahn, Ben. It's a new day, and they're trying to put the pass behind them in more ways than one. Well, they have to. They're obviously playing as, as poorly as they did last season in 2012. They've got to put that behind them, have tunnel vision leading into the 2013 the season. Team well, the Orange team wearing the white jerseys and led by quarterback Kyle Frazier will take the first snaps in this ball game. The teams have been evenly split with the first team offense uh, in the white primarily and the first team defense, second team defense out there right now. First carry of the ball game is by Trey Mason, the junior out of Lake Worth, Florida. Trey Mason rushed for over a thousand yards a year ago. 
Trevon Reed with the ball carry right there. Trevon Reed, the wide receiver, they'll be counting on him and pretty much everybody else in the wide receiver core to step up this year following the graduation of Emory Blake. Kyle Frazier will go to the air. Firing to the outside. Trevon Reed was the intended receiver. You see Reed with nine catches for 122 yards and a touchdown a year ago. Trevon's a player that they are expecting a lot of great things. They've got a lot of pressure on him this fall with the with the exit of Ontario McCaleb because that speed sweep, jet sweep guy, Gus Malzahn and Rhett Lashley's offense is a guy that every defense has to fear. So the ball goes over, no punt here. They'll put it at the 29-yard line. And so now the offense led by Jonathan Wallace will come onto the field. Wallace started the final four games a year ago, passing for 57.5% completion, 720 yards, four touchdowns, and four interceptions. You know, Matt, we talked about in the intro, one of the biggest things that these two quarterbacks have to establish is consistency. They really struggle with inconsistent play this morning. Ball is scooped up, and that's a touchdown. Justin Garrett, the star backer, was able to scoop up that bad snap and run it in for a touchdown. Well, that's a great start for the defense, not on that side of the ball for the offense. Poor execution there by Jonathan. He should catch that snap. That's a good snap by the center, one that you know should have been called and the play should have been executed. In fact, the snap nearly hit Gus Malzahn. Cody Parkey is on for the PAT. And the PAT is good. And the orange team has taken a 7-0 lead. Justin Garrett been paying immediate dividends and showing that playmaking ability, although that was a pretty easy play for him. Absolutely. It's a catch-22, Matt. You hate to see that offensive execution or lack thereof, but defensively it's a good sign of what's to come for guys like Justin Garrett, one that we expect a lot of great things from in 2013. Justin Garrett says he's been watching South Carolina film and studying the South Carolina film from when Ellis Johnson was the defensive coordinator there, and they utilized that as the spur position. Ellis Johnson back in the SEC. This is the fourth different stop for him as a defensive coordinator in this conference. And he's been very successful at every stop. Obviously, South Carolina, Alabama, he was at Clemson when I was in high school, and you hope, you hope that continues here. 61 years old, had a tough season as a one-year head coach at Southern Miss last year. Ball is carried to the 35-yard line by Cameron Artis Payne, a very intriguing running back, junior college transfer out of Allen Hancock College in California. More on his story as we proceed, but he picked up five on the play. Artis Payne gets the carry that time. He's dropped behind the line of scrimmage. The cornerback, Chris Davis, was the first guy there, as well as was the defensive end, Kenneth Carter, number 92. Cameron Artis Payne's a young man that if everybody can remember the name Ben Tate, he's going to remind everyone of Ben Tate. Where's the number 44? It runs downhill with a lot of speed, but he is a big back. 2,048 yards rushing and 25 touchdowns. Last season in junior college was rated by 24-7 sports as the number one junior college running back in the country. Wallace stands in there, fires, and it's caught at the 46-yard line. Good pocket presence there by Jonathan Wallace. A great throw across the middle. Sammy Coates made the grab, Ben. The guy in Sammy Coates' offense, so they are expecting a lot of great things from him, just like we mentioned for Von Reed. Sammy Coates is a guy that has great hands. It's just had not executed up to this point. Yeah, Rhett Lashley says that Sammy Coates, they know he can make the wow play. Now it's just make the ordinary and routine play. You're exactly right. Just the play. You know, it had to be spectacular every single snap. Second down, Wallace throws complete here on the near sideline. 
Ricardo Lewis, he's another one of the guys. Big wide receiver, much like uh, Sammy Coates. Sammy Coates, 6'2", 201. Ricardo, 6'2", 217. Guys that have a world of potential, but they're waiting for that potential to become reality. Absolutely. They need to get the ball in their hands. It's obviously the art of Gus Malzahn's offense is letting the quarterback distribute the football quickly and often. Had a man wide open. That was Ricardo Lewis, and he couldn't run it down. Brett Lashley, 29 years old and the new offensive coordinator for the uh, Auburn Tigers, but has been with uh, Coach Gus Malzahn for the last 15 years as a high school quarterback and then as an assistant coach. If there is anybody that knows Gus Malzahn's offense, it's going to be Brett Lashley. He's a tremendous guy, an unbelievable amount of character, one that you want your son to be around and be coached by. So the ball goes over on downs, first and 10 with the ball at the 20 yard line. So the blue now will have their second possession of the ball game. They went three and out the first time around. The one score just happened in the opening couple of minutes when Justin Garrett picked up a fumble and ran it in for a touchdown. Frazier. Ball is tipped up in the air by Reed and was unable to hold on to it. These are areas here, Matt. The last two throws by each quarterback have been inconsistent. Obviously, you know, Jonathan made a great throw across the middle to Sammy Coach, but then misses a potential touchdown throw there on the edge to Ricardo Lewis. Here to Trevon Reed, Kyle Fraser throws a high slip screen and that gives him a chance to be athletic. Yeah, that's the one thing that Rhett Lashley told us. They need to improve on their consistency and the accuracy of their throws as Trey Mason gets the carry, and Mason is run out of bounds at the 25-yard line, picked up about five on the play. Top line number 15, Joshua Mason showed a world of potential at times a year ago at three 100-yard rushing games. Just went over 1,000 yards, obviously, in the Iron Bowl in that game. So, you know, you expect a lot of great things from him. He's become much more of a leader. Uh, this season, this spring, when he was last year. Pump fake, Frazier to the air and down the sideline, and Reed makes the grab, unable to hold on to it. Ball came out. Great defense by Robinson Therese there, a guy that's really, really played, be played well last season and obviously done well this spring as well. You see number 27, Therese, and Therese is the guy that's backing up Justin Garrett at that star backer position and a guy that when they go with six DBs would be a starter at that position. Yes. So the ball goes over on downs as the offense led by Kyle Frazier has had consecutive three and outs. And now Jonathan Wallace's offense will go back out on the field. Wallace first career start came in a 42 seven win against New Mexico State right here on CSS the first Saturday in November and he started the final three games after that. Ball at the 35. And that's Ricardo Lewis on that jet sweep. Lewis gets across the 40 yard line, picks up about seven on the play. Lewis had only three catches for 36 yards a year ago. In fact, all of the returning receivers for Auburn Total just 54 catches a year ago, just four more than Emory Blake had by himself. Well, and, and you know, that's a relative statement, too. I only went in three games. Offensively, Auburn production wise, we just didn't have, they didn't have guys make plays for them and obviously didn't stack up statistics. Cameron Artis Payne, number 44. He's out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He was out of football for two whole seasons before he enrolled and played at junior college. He'll be 23 this summer. Lewis makes the grab, but the tackle is made by Jonathan Mincy. Number 21, Jonathan Mincy making that tackle, the guy that Ellis Johnson says he and Chris Davis, number 11, have been the most consistent players on the defensive side of the ball from day one of practice. And that's what you want. That's what you want, especially defensively. You don't want flash in the pan kind of guys. They want to be there every day and bring the lunch bell to work. Ricardo Lewis getting another grab. I think Lewis has made more catches and touched the ball more here in the opening few minutes of this uh, A-Day game than he did all of last year. And one thing you're going to see in Gus's offense or Coach Lashley's offense, they're going to do things early, quick game-wise, hitches, slant, screens to establish some confidence in these quarterbacks because these, both of these guys, Wallace and Frazier, 
their game, second game, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, are predicated on success early. Third and three now from the 47-yard line. Frazier got a man inside the 30-yard line. Catch made by C.J. Uzama, the tight end. C.J. is a young man that missed the last few games of 2012 due to a wrist injury. He is an unbelievable talent, only a sophomore, I believe, because that can be extremely, extremely dangerous from tight end or the slot position. Wallace tried to fire the ball into Sammy Coates that time off his hand. Uzama out of North Gwinnett High School in the Atlanta area had seven catches and a touchdown a year ago. And Auburn's blessed with a lot of talent at tight end. Brandon Fulce and also Ricky Parks, who was one of the top tight ends of the nation when he signed in 2012, will man that position this year. Second down and 10. Cameron Artis Payne, touchdown. CAP caps the drive with a touchdown run. The touchdown run, 27 yards. This running play here for the Auburn fans, this is a staple in Gus Malzahn's offense. Just your off tackle from the shotgun, offensive back set to the left, runs to the opposite side and follows the lead blockers. So the blue gets on the board, and Cody Parkey is on for the PAT. And we're tied at seven. Cameron Artis Payne scores his first touchdown as an Auburn Tiger takes it 27 yards to cap the Blues touchdown drive. And it's a tie game, five minutes in. You're watching the 2013 Auburn A Day game, five minutes in. The orange and the blue are tied at seven. Three early enrollees playing in this game today, Ben, for the Auburn Tigers. We've seen one of them right there. Artis Payne, the running back, scored the touchdown. He's the number one rated junior college running back. Devontae Danzi, number 53, an offensive guard, the number one junior college offensive guard. And three-star Ben Bradley, who will number 50, the number nine junior college defensive tackle. Well, these are young men that expect to have an early impact, and not just an impact, a good impact on this football team. They come in to learn the offense or defense or whatever there already is to be able to lead on into the summer and in the fall camp. Number 50 is Ben Bradley, a sophomore who started at Norcross Georgia High School in the Atlanta area and then played last season at Hutchinson, Kansas Community College. Not much running room on that play right there as Trey Mason got the carry. Jamel President, defensive end, made the tackle for the blue team. President, a 6'4", 250-pound redshirt freshman out of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and Wando High School. And these defensive ends have some big shoes to fill with the exit of Corley Manier. Mason gets the handoff again. And Mason gets wrapped up and dropped at the 35-yard line. Harrison Gaston, or Harris Gaston made the tackle along with Jonathan Jones. Personal foul, face mask, number 58, defense. Number 58, Harris Gaston was called for the face mask, so they'll tack on the infraction to the end of the run. One of those defensive ends you're talking about, Corey Lemonier, will be a draft pick within a week. They have to replace him. He was a tremendous talent, made a lot of big plays here on the Plains. He's obviously an early exit. He left, it, left Auburn as a junior, will be drafted next week in the NFL, will have a very prominent career. Trey Mason on the carry again, very similar play to the one they just ran as they get the ball across the 50-yard line. And Ellis Johnson says in the Auburn defensive scheme, Defensive ends have to be impact players. Right now, D. Ford and Nosa Igwe are running first team at defensive end. They'll also have Elijah Daniel and Carl Lawson coming in in the summer as part of that big recruiting class. Well, they will be two young men that come in as, as true freshmen and will have a lot of high expectations on them to be impact players and do so quickly. Jalen Denson on the catch. Number 89, Jalen Denson has only one catch in his 23 career games. But there's a guy 
According to Rhett Lashley, there's no guy more than Jalen Denson who has had a bigger spring and has really proven that he wants to catch the ball. Well, with this new staff now, there's just a breath of fresh air for these young men and the opportunity to shine and do what they were supposed to do when they got the crew. Trey Mason has been limited at times during the spring camp because of an ankle injury, but getting plenty of carries here today. He was the first uh, Auburn player, non-quarterback Auburn player since Bo Jackson in 1985 to lead the team in total offense a year ago. Probably more of an indictment on the ineffectiveness they had at quarterback than it was a praise for the running back. I, I would have to agree. It's not. It's very uncommon for someone other than your quarterback to uh, to lead in total offense. Kyle Frazier scrambling and will step out of bounds at the 33-yard line. This is an area of, of Jonathan Wallace's game that you don't expect to see. Jonathan's not a scrambler, not a guy that's going to step up in the pocket and make plays outside of that, but he is athletic and can make plays when necessary. Jonathan Wallace there. I think I identified him as Kyle Frazier, number 12, Jonathan Wallace running the offense. Wallace with the uh, highest quarterback rating for a freshman in Auburn history, 139.6, better than uh, number two on the list, Jason Campbell, and number three on the list, Stan White. So third down and six. There is a flood. Full snap, lay of game, offense, five yard penalty, still third down. So a five yard mark off against the uh, white team, the orange team as it's known on the scoreboard, led by the orange team quarterback right here, number 12, Jonathan Wallace. And they will interchange the teams. Kyle Frazier started out as the quarterback of this offensive unit and now has been replaced by Jonathan Wallace. So they'll be going back and forth. So be patient with us because sometimes they're going to change teams in the middle of the game. The ball is intercepted by Ryan Smith to safety. Once again, inconsistent play. Jonathan sits in the pocket just a little too long, tries to make a play where it's, it's unnecessary. This makes a poor throw. Ryan Smith makes the pick. Great play. Rhett Lashley not happy with that interception thrown by Jonathan Wallace. And he says nobody has really stepped forward in that quarterback battle distinguish themselves. Therefore, Jeremy Johnson, the true freshman, Nick Marshall, the junior college transfer, will have a shot once they get on campus this summer. It could be a quarterback battle, Ben, that is not decided until very late in preseason practice. I, I would I would have to say that because obviously these two young men, they've just not separated themselves and really determined who's going to be the guy. You know, the inconsistency is a huge problem, one that August Miles on offense just cannot have. That's why Jeremy Johnson and Nick Marshall, the door is absolutely wide open for them this fall. Quarterback sack as Kyle Frazier is tagged in the backfield. Frazier now running the offense for the blue team. Nosa Igwe gets credit for that quarterback sack. The play loses seven yards. Third down, 14. Igwe, the most experienced of the players on the defensive side of the ball with 31 career starts. You see he had 23 tackles a year ago in a sack. We talked about the loss of Corey Lemonier, but he was not the leading quarterback sacker on this team a year ago. It was number 95, D4, as the ball is picked up by Kenneth Carter. Kenneth Carter recovers the fumble and returns it to the 16-yard line. So here in the first quarter, we've seen some pretty big mistakes by the quarterbacks. Just a poor execution there. It's supposed to be the round, you know, the roundabout Statue of Liberty draw to Cameron Artis Payne. Kyle Frazier just doesn't handle the ball properly. And obviously Kenneth Carter, the senior defensive lineman, picks the ball up and makes a little bit of makes a run out of it. So we saw a bad snap that you feel like Jonathan Wallace should have fielded. We see a miscommunication, mishandled snap right there to uh, Cameron Artis Payne, and we've seen an interception thrown by Jonathan Wallace here in the first quarter. Well, this is going to be the Achilles heel of the Auburn offense if the quarterback, the guy that touches the ball every snap, is not able to execute and do so well. 
Ellis Johnson would like to see an increase in the takeaways for this uh, Auburn team from a year ago. Only two interceptions by this Auburn team last year, and only one came out of the secondary, and that was Trent Fisher. Double move, man wide open, touchdown. Brandon Fulce, the tight end. So the Orange team cashes in right away following the fumble. Well, there's one of your plethora of tight ends there. Fulce just runs a simple out and up. Good throw by Jonathan Wallace. But obviously, Auburn's tight end position is pretty full, obviously, with the exit of Philip Luxenkirk. And they've got some guys that can fill that void. And as you see here, Fulce makes a great Cody catch. Parkey Cody Parkey on for the PAT. Parkey hammers it through, and with three minutes and 43 seconds to play in the first quarter, the Orange team has taken a 14-7 lead. Let's take a look at the uh, top 10 prospects in the 2013 signing class. It was a great class put together by Gus Malzahn and his uh, staff. Five-star Montravius Adams, number two rated defensive tackle. Five-star Carl Lawson. Number one rated weak side defensive end, five star Elijah Daniel, three star, I mean, five star number three strong side defensive end. And then you see the rest of some playmakers and Jason Smith, Tony Stevens, the running back Jonathan Ford, the four star quarterback Jeremy Johnson out of Montgomery Carver, who we saw a number of times here on CSS. Nick Marshall, Peyton Barber, running back Ernest Robinson, a lot of talent, both sides of the ball coming in well with the rebound in which all things considered looking at the way they finished the signing class that this staff put together after basically their late entry into the SEC a phenomenal job by this staff putting it big tackle big stick here by Justin Garrett in the open field on Ricardo Lewis and that's one of the things that Justin Garrett said was one of the big challenges in the star position was covering slot receivers and tackling in open space. Did a good job right there. He's going to find out in that position what you're going to have on each offense, each opposing offense. The best athlete they have is in the slot position. So it's tough to cover those guys in space, especially if you have the size to fill the gap or fill the void of a pulling tackle to stop the running game. Ellis Johnson says the versatility and flexibility of our entire offense will lie in the success of that star backer so no pressure whatsoever on Justin Garrett Robinson Therese who will man that star backer position just the flexibility and versatility of the entire defense. Well I, I think one of the big things one of the big attributes that Ellis Johnson looks for in that position is a guy that's just a football player. He's just a, a ball hawk that knows where the things are, has really good instincts, and knows what to do and when to do it. Yeah, Ellis Johnson says you have to have the knack and you have to have the athletic ability. And sometimes you can take a linebacker, but if you can't play in space, not going to work. You can take a safety, and if you can't be physical enough against the run, not going to work. You just got to keep looking until you find the right player for that position. Well, you go back and look at the 2012, 2012 football season, you had a guy in Jake Hall and a guy in Casanova McKenzie. Well, Jake knew exactly where to be at all points in time, but he was one or two steps slow. Casanova was the perfect opposite of that, which he was, didn't know exactly where to go and when to be there, but he moved with record. Savannah. Going to run some wildcat here. That's Quan Bray lined up in the shotgun position, and he'll take the snap and he'll keep it himself. Got a block, and Quan Bray with a little burst across the 30 yard line. Pick up about seven yards on the play for Quan Bray. Quan is another young man that you're going to expect to see a lot out of this year. He's obviously going to come into that jet sweep, a multiple, multiple set kind of guy that can handle the ball at any point in time. Frazier back in there at quarterback. Nothing doing on that play right there. Third down two. Cameron Artis Payne in there. Is that a different number 44? the beauty of the spring game. First down from the 45.
Auburn trying to rebound from a 3 and 9, 0 oh and 8 SEC season a year ago. Their worst season in 60 years, replacing 13 seniors. We've mentioned Lutz and Kirkin on the offensive side of the ball. Ontario McCaleb. Frazier loads up and goes deep, had a man, and Trevon Reed couldn't hold on to it. Frazier's pass intended for Trevon Reed, incomplete. Defended by number 19, Ryan White. Second down. We talked about inconsistency on the quarterbacks. I'd have to say that's catchable ball. Yeah. Second down and 10. Rhett Lashley says there's going to be opportunities for the freshman at wide receiver. Simply, if for no other reason, numbers. There's only six scholarship players at wide receiver. So do the math. There's guys coming in like Ernest Robinson, like Tony Stevens, like Jason Smith, who are going to get opportunities to play and maybe impact play right away. No doubt. Damian Craig obviously coming from Florida State and former quarterback here. You know, Damian has got his hands full with these young guys coming in, but they are extremely, extremely talented. And what you hope is that they're able to execute and be successful from the standpoint of ignorance is bliss. Big gainer down the sideline and a big hit at the end of it. Cameron Artis Payne wearing the blue jersey earlier, now wearing the white jersey. Turns the screen into a 50-plus gainer. Tremendous one-handed catch even to start the play. Jonathan Jones at the end of the play made the tackle, and there's a touchdown for Trevon Reed. The Orange has taken a 20 to 7 lead. There's the touchdown pass to Trevon Reed. Nicely executed out on the edge with Brandon Fultz throwing a good block. A simple bubble screen to Trevon. I mean, it, it's a catch and throw. One thing misconception that people have about Gus's offensive style is everything is trick. Everything is sit in the pocket, make plays, or do things outside the box. Gus is a simple <laughs> offensive <laughs> mind from the standpoint of right catch ball, throw ball, run the ball downfield north and south. Cody Parkey with the PAT to make it 21 to 7. So Kyle Frazier with the touchdown pass. And Fulce, number 11, throwing the block that got him into the end zone. You were talking about Damian Craig, Ben, and here's a list of the brand new staff. And I think the key ingredient on that staff, and we'll see that in a moment. I think the key ingredient on the coaching staff is that all of them have great recruiting resumes. They're known as guys that can go out and get players. Well, they can go out and get players. They've got First a great recruiting pedigree. But obviously, Matt, once you get them here, you have to be able to coach them and, and lead these guys, you lead these young men and turn these boys into men. And I think knowing some of these coaches like Rodney Garner, Ellis Johnson, Rhett Lashley, and obviously Daniel the Craig, they have the pedigree and the ability to do that in all facets of the game. Patrick Lyman on the carry that time. Second down six. It's really hard to, to make any kind of definitive statement about which team is playing better. The Orange is leading the Blue 21 to 7. We know that. But Kyle Frazier, both quarterbacks have played for both teams. We've seen Cameron Artis Payne play for both teams. Ricardo Lewis gets hung up there and slung out of bounds at about the 28-yard line. So guys are playing on both sides wearing blue and white jerseys. So at some point they could be playing for the losing team and then they're playing for the winning team. There are two fouls on the play. Personal foul, face mask, number nine, defense. Personal foul, face mask, offense. Penalties offset, replay second down. Rodney Garner has returned to his alma mater. Of course, an all SEC offensive lineman here for the Tigers in 1990. Had spent the last 15 years on the staff of the Georgia Bulldogs. Rodney Garner was my first exposure to Auburn University and actually was the one that offered me my scholarship. How about that?
in the round again that's Ricardo Lewis tell us about that experience getting the offer from and of course that was his first head coach his, his first assistant coaching job pardon me Auburn then he went to Tennessee then to Georgia now back at all well and coach Gardner was just the ultimate professional he came in started recruiting me as a as a junior uh, and, and it was my first exposure to Auburn in general just simply because of what he brought to the table. And he had me in, come to the Iron Bowl in 1995. And I, and I made the, the blatant question of Coach, would you make all these comments about this game? I really am not familiar with what you were referring to as the Iron Bowl. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And it's what set the tone for me for the rest of my career. We've completed one quarter at Jordan-Hare Stadium, the Orange, leading the Blue 21-7 in the 2013 Auburn A-Day game. You're watching the 2013 Auburn A-Day game presented by Cook's Pest Control. And Auburn would like to thank Golden Flake for their title sponsorship of today's game. Golden Flake, the official snack of the Auburn Tigers for over 50 years. In fact, I had me some of that sweet hot barbecue potato chips before the game just to get me started. Sweet heat, <laughs> best on the market. There you go, Matt Stewart and Ben Leard with you as you watch the Auburn A-Day game. Emily Gagnon down on the sidelines and Gus Malzahn in the visor as the head coach here at Auburn for his first game. Head coach at Arkansas State last season won the Sun Belt Championship going nine and three. Number 72, Sean Coleman, the left tackle of the Coleman infraction. Coleman's a great story. A former five-star signee in 2010, number 72. Diagnosed with leukemia before he ever showed up on campus, actually did not enroll until 2011, and his eligibility clock did not start until 2012. Just a unique kid. He is, a, he is what you would refer to as, a, as an absolute fighter, one that you're just blessed to be around. First and 15. Handoff by Jonathan Wallace. So Sean Coleman's battling for playing time on that offensive line. 6'6", 294-pound, redshirt sophomore officially out of uh, Memphis. I believe redshirt freshman, pardon me, I think I referred to him as redshirt sophomore, redshirt freshman. But Rhett Lashley says on the offensive line, officially all the jobs are wide open, but they really like what they're getting out of number 73, Greg Robinson, the left tackle. Number 50, Reese Dismukes, the center who has started 23 games. Well, you know, we talked about the quarterbacks. We obviously have mentioned the word inconsistency with the quarterback play there and in there out. But, I mean, I, I personally feel as if the most important positions on this offensive football team is the success of the offensive line. They played very poorly last season, did not give the young quarterbacks, the new starters, ample time to make plays in the pocket. And therefore, it translated into poor play by the quarterback. So it's, a, it's a, the ultimate team game. If the offensive line is not playing well and executing, that definitely translates into the play of the running backs and the quarterbacks. Justin Garrett defensing that pass intended for the tight end, C.J. Uzama. And the ball will go back over. And here's that coaching staff we were talking about. Rodney Garner, Ellis Johnson, the defensive coordinator, Charlie Harbison, long time with Ellis at a number of different stops, co-defensive coordinator, Melvin Smith, the cornerback coach, Rhett Lashley, OC, Damian Craig coming from Florida State, co-OC, Scott Fountain, special teams and tight ends, J.B. Grimes, the offensive line coach who was with uh, Malzahn at Arkansas State, and Tim Horton, the running backs coach. Tremendous, tremendous staff. And obviously, the thing that people want, uh, that goes unnoticed, is the importance of how big that was, especially for Damian Craig to leave Jimbo Fisher mm -hmm. at Florida State. Pass was completed to Quan Bray. Bray out of bounds at the 28-yard line. They did a tremendous job. Gene Chiswick and the previous staff had put together a great recruiting class, but essentially when Chiswick and his staff was dismissed, Gus Malzahn came in with two months to go right before signing day. They had to re-recruit all of those guys. They didn't keep all of them, but they kept a lot of them and built off of that class, too. They did, and I, the, the difficult part of that, Matt, is the 
fact that they didn't retain any of the assistants on that staff that had established relationships with those recruits. So I think that goes unsaid and how, how fast a job that they did in the recruiting process to reestablish relationships with these kids and, and sign them ultimately to come play for Auburn. Third down and three, Trey Mason gets the carry. That's a first down and more for Trey Mason as he scoots across the 45-yard line. Trey Mason carries for the first down. One thing that Trey Mason has mentioned in the offseason that he has worked on is his peripheral vision, be able to make plays inside the box and step up in holes that really are non-existent until you get right in front of them. Trey Mason, three 100-yard rushing games a year ago, starting with the game against Clemson. While we were showing you uh, the Trey Mason highlights, Trevon Reed made another catch down to the 41-yard line. Another big run by Trey Mason. Mason, I don't think there's any question Mason's going to be the number one running back, and I think we've seen Artis Payne have a a good game already today. We haven't seen Corey Grant yet, who they said has had a very good spring as well. Well, and Trey's going to be the guy, deservedly so. As you see here, he does a really good job following lead blocker Jay Price, who's just an unbelievable blocker and a guy that's probably the most unselfish football player on this football team. Now, one thing that we're dealing with right here is this hurry up, no huddle, high tempo offense. They're running plays so quick, it's hard for us to get replays in. Well, it's difficult to keep up with, that's for sure. Frazier steps out of bounds. But they really run a very fast offense. They've gotten back to that. It's what was so successful when Malzahn was here as the OC. And Frazier, for one, says the terminology and the plays are exactly the same pretty much as when he was here the first time and Frazier was a freshman. So picking up the offense has been an easy thing for Kyle Frazier Kyle to do as he runs for the touchdown. touchdown. And I think honestly, quite honestly, Matt, that's probably one of the areas that have been most frustrating for the offensive coaching staff in that Frazier has not separated himself. Because of his familiarity with the offensive terminology and the execution phases of this offense, Kyle Frazier has been exposed to this offense since he was in high school. Mm -hmm. So you would think that he would know it like the back of his hand and be able to execute with ultimate confidence. But unfortunately, through the spring and up until up until this point today, he's not able, been able to do so on a consistent basis. Well, Frazier runs for the touchdown right there, and Cody Parkey's on for another PAT. And he makes it 28-7. to seven. <laughs> So three and a half minutes into the second quarter, Kyle Frazier runs around the corner for a touchdown, and the Orange now has a 28-7 lead on the Blues. Eight thirty-eight to play in the first half. The Orange leading the Blue 28-7 as you watch the 2013 Auburn A-Day game. Presented by Cook's Pest Control. While you watch the game, you can also follow along on Twitter at Matt underscore Stewart CSS. You can also follow our network at CSS Sports and like us on Facebook. So, Ben, you obviously played quarterback here for the Auburn Tigers. Give us your early assessment after 15 minutes of watching these two quarterbacks. Uh, you know, again, we, we continue to go back to the word inconsistent, but they're making some good plays. Obviously, you see Kyle score on the end of round, or excuse me, the, the, the keep there on the left side, but they're plays that, that you expect these young men to make. Being an SEC caliber quarterback, they are expected to make big plays, play in and play out. And this, up until this point, they haven't done so on a consistent basis. I would like to see more of that if possible. Wallace throws a tunnel screen to Ricardo Lewis. We've seen Lewis very much involved in that type portion of the game plan as well as also some speed sweeps as well. The pass was low out on the uh, outside to uh, Dimitri Reese. What about that portion of the game plan? It's obvious that Ricardo Lewis at least based on what we've seen so far here today, has a bigger role. He's got a huge role. He's going to be one that there's a lot of things that are expected of him 
they are going to put the ball in his hands to be able to make plays because ultimately these are athletes. In order for them to be successful and do things productively, they've got to have the ball in their hands. And that's one of the mantras of Gus's offense or Rhett's play calling abilities is the quarterback is not the guy that's going to score the touchdowns. It's the receivers and the running backs. So they want the quarterback to hold on to the ball as little as possible. Wallace going deep and has a man wide open. It is complete to Sammy Coates. Coach with the grab inside the 30-yard line. Sammy's another young man that is a very, very dynamic receiver. Just a tremendous throw here by Jonathan Wallace. Makes up for the for the for the poor throw off the right edge just a second ago, but just a really good offensive play all around. Second catch for Coach in this ball game. I looked up. We've got a huge crowd here today. They were expecting it could be the largest A Day game attendance ever. At the start of the game, the uh, the upper deck was pretty much empty, and I just looked up for the first time and noticed that it's full now. I'm anxious to hear the head kick, really and truly. Obviously, people coming to see the new staff, the new football team, and the new era of Auburn football, and of course they're here for the for the five o'clock last roll in the Tumors corner as well. And to see Dimitri Reese catch the touchdown pass. So Dimitri Reese with a couple of big catches on this possession, and the blue gets back on the board with Jonathan Wallace throwing the touchdown pass. Two great throws in a row by Jonathan Wallace, one that you hope he continues to build on because obviously he's got some confidence flowing. That hopefully translates into the remainder of the game. So that makes it 28-13. Cody Parkey's going to have to ice down his leg. That's six PATs for him here in the first uh, 17 minutes of the game. Good protection here. Just an upfront stunt by the middle linebackers on the, on the orange defense. Good job by the offensive line picking that up. Good throw by Jonathan Wallace. Now, what's important is we take a look back at this play now because you don't have a live shot on the quarterback. This is a much different play if the defender who's coming through the line right there has an open shot on Wallace. It's going to change the complexion of the play. He doesn't have to worry about getting pounded right there. Absolutely. It's a good job by the offensive line, the running back stepping up and making that pick up there. A lot of communication is going to have to take place up front in order to pick that blitz up. In an SEC regular season game, he's going to have to get rid of that ball, and even if he does, he's going to get nailed. Absolutely, without without a doubt. Jonathan Wallace, he would have been picking himself up off the ground in an SEC regular season game. So first and ten now, ball at the 30-yard line, and Wallace stays out there, and now will man the uh, orange team offense. Fires, and Wallace starting to pick up a little rhythm here as he throws complete to the far side. Catch was made by Quan Bray. Matt, both of these quarterbacks are young men that, that need good things to happen to them early because they obviously had a little bit of confidence get shaken last season, so they need things good to happen. In order for that to, to, ha to take place, they throw these short balls, these bubble screens, and have success. Just completing balls, big plays, let your athletes make plays for you. Consecutive catches made by Quan Bray. Tackle was made by Mac Van Gorder. Van Gorder, the son of Brian Van Gorder, the former defensive coordinator. His dad, of course, no longer coaching here, but he stays on with the program. That's got to be a tough spot. Third down and five. Wallace given time, throws underneath, completed the 40-yard line. Catch made by Cameron Artis Payne. It's a great job. A sign of maturity on Jonathan Wallace's part to be able to stand in the pocket, go through your progression, and come to the check down, especially on a third and five. Payne gets the handoff this time, and Payne dancing through the line, picks up a first down. Did a nice job of uh, with vision and seeing the opening and the place to run. Well, the place to run there was following number 35. Jay Prosh. Payne again. Payne down to the 41-yard line. And Jay Prosh, that was a good, you pointed out Jay Prosh. Rhett Lashley said that he was surprised when he found out and got a first-hand, you know, practice look at Jay Prosh. 
found out that he's much more athletic than he thought he was. Jay is a tremendous athlete. Tremendous athlete. Unbelievably strong. Highly intelligent. And, and we referred to this on the defensive side of the ball earlier. Jay's a football player. He is so unselfish. He's willing to play any position that he's capable of playing and do whatever he can for the success of the football team. Payne, another gain. Cameron Artis Payne running the ball very well here. Among the running backs, he has probably shown the most explosiveness thus far. Absolutely. And what you're seeing here offensively, this is the tempo and the success and the management at which Gus Malzahn's offense likes to operate. There he goes again. He is uh, at 11 carries. You're having that because his stats are on both sides of the ledger. I'm having to do a little bit of quick math here, but that's 11 carries now for 89 yards. And he's also uh, caught two passes for 47 yards. I'd say Cameron Artis Payne. And we're not going to keep saying all three names. We're just going to call him CAP just to make it easy on me. CAP is probably the early star. Oh, absolutely. The early star. You know, Matt, one misconception that people have about, about this offense, this style of offense, is that it's a finesse. It's a speed offense. This, they will run the ball downfield and inside, downhill and inside the tackles. You actually ask Gus Malzahn if he runs a, runs a uh, no huddle, high tempo offense, he gets quite offended. Let's take a look at that play again. That was a good job right there. Kyle Frazier on the check down going to his secondary receiver. Actually, Jonathan Wallace, pardon me. Jonathan Wallace. Nothing open in the end zone through the to the guy underneath. Very good job. I and mean, what you'll see, Matt, the, the, what what determines how they run those particular plays in this offense, and two of the touchdown passes that were thrown are wheel routes, and that's determined off the success of the short throws, the hitches, the bubble screens. Trey Mason with the touchdown run. And so Jonathan Wallace leads that touchdown drive to make it 34-14. Once again, inside the tackles, downhill running game for the touchdown. Good job by the offensive line, you know, road grading that, that way for Trey Mason. 35-14 now. Let's check in down on the sideline with Emily Gagnon. She's standing by with one of the last year's stars, Ontario McKayla. Hey, guys, I'm with former running back Ontario McKayla. Just talk a little bit about what you're seeing from the running back out here right now who are kind of stepping up a little bit. Uh, I, I think they're going out there and they, they're playing hard and they're running the ball good, you know. Ashley got to play with uh, Trey Mason, uh, Corey Grant, and uh, Patrick Lyman, uh, a walk-on running back. I, I also got to play with those guys last year. And even before that, I had Trey with me. Uh, I think they're going to do really good. I know how Trey is. I know how Corey is. I know how, I know they have the same e ego as I had when I was here. I wanted to win. I wanted to do anything to win. Who do you think is going to get the starting job? Uh, to me, uh, I don't know. It, 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 it's it's going to be pretty hard. It's going to be tough. But I think I think Trey going to run, end up getting, run, being a starting running back. Now let's talk a little bit about you. You're training for the draft. Uh, you have less than a week to go. What's this been like for you? Uh, it's it's just, it's just been been you know to me I think it's, it's just a blessing for me to to get an opportunity to even go to the next level and show my talent and help a team whatever team that drafts me or, or or picks me up or win even even if it's on special teams or whatever I have to do to help the team win I just want to be able to play ball because I love the game so much. Thank you so much. Best of luck this weekend, guys. Back up to you. Thank you, Emily. Ontario McKayla rushed for 2,586 career yards, 1,360 return yards, and 620 receiving yards. All those numbers mean he was just the second player ever in the SEC to rush for more than 2,000, return more than 1,000, and receive more than 500. The the exit of Ontario McKayla leaves a huge void of production for the Auburn offense. So you've got to ha have a high expectation for guys like Quan Bray, Trevon Reed, and Corey Grant as well. I believe Kenneth Carter just recovered his second fumble of the game, number 92. He's been in the right place at the right time today. The fumble recovered by number 17, Chris Frost. Chris Frost officially number 17, credited with the fumble recovery. Watch him in the middle of your screen, 17. Yep, he got on top of it. 
Although Carter was there first, Frost ended up on top of it. So the ball goes over at the 27-yard line. Chris Frost, we mentioned him there in that replay. He's another young man that people expect a lot of great things out of. It's 6'2", 230 pounds, a sophomore from North Carolina. You know, he, he had a great offseason last year before the 2012 season. Expected a lot of playing time, and it just didn't happen. It didn't come to fruition, and no one really could understand why. He's going to get a chance to make plays in this Ellis Johnson defense, and Coach Johnson expects him to be successful. So first and ten now for the Orange team as they go back on offense out of the Wildcat. Snap goes to Trevon Reed and nothing doing for Reed as the play gets blown up by Craig, Park, Craig Sanders, pardon me, number 13. Well, Ellis Johnson says that they're, they have talent at linebacker. They just don't have a lot of experience at linebacker. And he expects uh, Kenny Flowers, the former uh, Parkview High School star of Atlanta, who played at Hutchinson Community College last season, to come in and have a chance to make an immediate impact. Kenny Flowers had over 100 tackles last year as a teammate alongside Devontae Danzi and Ben Bradley at Hutch. All of these newcomers that are coming to Auburn, obviously the, the early entries for the guys that are here this spring, the new guys coming in this fall, they're going to have opportunities to, to excel and be given the chances to play. So third down now and more than 10. Ball at the 29-yard line. To the air. Just out of the reach of the intended wide receiver, Jalen Denson. Flag down back at the 30-yard line. So they'll bring the field goal unit on, and Cody Parkey will line up. This will be about a 46 or 47 yard attempt. Cody Parkey to attempt the field goal. Stephen Clark in the hole. This is 46 yard attempt for. Cody Parkey, he was 11 of 14 on his kicks last season, but misses on that. Well, here's a look back at what happened in 2012. And there were some close losses early in particular. I think the Clemson loss at the Georgia Dome, a very close loss against LSU. And then things kind of unraveled from there and pro progressively got worse the last three conference games, Texas A&M, Georgia, and Alabama against very good competition, but often simply not competitive well, in those games. Just a season you don't want to remember, to be quite honest with you. As an Auburn, former Auburn player, an Auburn fan, one that you like, do like Coach Malzahn said, put in the past and keep moving forward. But the Clemson game is one they had an opportunity to win. They had the ball late and could not execute late to score and win the game. LSU was the same way. Against Texas A&M, quite honestly, the wheels fell off. Yep. It, it just it was it was Katie Barr at the door. Uh, the season was virtually over at that point, and the kids saw that it, regardless of what they did in their efforts, there was not going to be a lot of success. Seasons can be so very fragile. You played a lot of football in your life, but had they won the Clemson game, had they won the LSU game, how that might have impacted the rest of the season, maybe not at all, but you got to feel like it might have. Well, you have to. Right? Being, being the ultimate optimist like I am, you got to go back and think of that Clemson game, number one. If you win that game on national television, the exposure that you have would obviously have been a positive thing. Then you come at home against LSU, top five team ranked in the country. You take them down to the wide, you win that game. What it does to me is it translates to the young players in this football team that we are successful, we can be good, and it establishes a little bit of aura to that, a little bit more confidence, a little bit more swagger that would play on for the rest of the season. So it's halftime here in the 2013 Auburn A-Day game. The Orange leading the Blue by a score of 35-14. When we come back, Christina Chambers is going to take a look at one final day at Toomer's Corner. A huge A-Day crowd here at Jordan-Hare Stadium as we start the third quarter. The Auburn A-Day game presented by Cook's Pest Control. They were anticipating, Ben, perhaps 
the largest crowd ever for a spring football game and will effort to get attendance numbers before we check out here. Well, it's exciting to see. Obviously, it, you know, having a new coaching staff and a new football team essentially in a new era, uh, it brought a lot of people to the Plains. Last night in town, it was like a game day Friday. And it's exciting to see as a former player that fans, after last season's debacle, we're only winning three games and the departure of Gene Chizik, for everyone to maintain support and, uh, and, and the Auburn family continues to pull for these kids. On second down pass. Oh, man, what a hit. And a flag comes out. Man, that was some kind of hit by Jonathan Mincy, and Dimitri Reese has still yet to get up. This is something you don't see a lot in spring games. Friendly fire, but Mincy uh, did not hold anything back. Let's listen in on ground level. Oh, that hurt my teeth. That is a play, but we mentioned earlier the discipline. That is a play in itself. First Jonathan Mincy is going to get an earful from the the because one, you make that that's play, a that's, a, that's a helmet to helmet spot. contact. A 15-yard penalty, personal foul, defense. and then the, the, the essential taunting of your own teammate at that point. That's something that will be cured come fall. Ricardo, or Dimitri Reese rather, has yet to get up off the field. And Jonathan Mincy comes to the sideline. Again, that's not something that you see very often. You don't usually see teammates hitting teammates that ferociously in the spring football game. Flag came out immediately, and you see the helmet to helmet contact. And hopefully, Dimitri Reese is okay. Reese caught a touchdown pass earlier in this game. Although, I don't think he, there was never any helmet to helmet. On that angle, it did not look like they hit helmets. He just looks like he hit him hard up top, leading with the shoulder. I'm not sure. It's, it's hard to tell. That angle didn't look like there was helmet contact. And, you know, Mincy did a great job of holding the block of Ricardo Lewis. But just the after-the-play antics are things that can be left in the locker room. They're... Watch this. I don't think there's helmet there. Yeah, I think shoulder. But you're right, it's the uh, standing over him like that. And it looks like, and hopefully, Dimitri Reese is okay. Well, if you go back and look at that particular replay and you pay special attention to the, to the referee at that point, he was pulling the flag upon the hit. So from his vantage point, it looked as if it was a contact. It wasn't the taunting that brought the flag. So a 15-yard mark off, so now the blue team has it at the 45-yard line. Lyman gets the carry. And Patrick Lyman picks up about three yards on the play. Lyman with nine carries so far in this ball game. He is outside of Trey Mason, carried the ball. Well, actually, let me take that back because Artis Payne has carried the ball 13 times, eight for the orange and five for the blue. He's actually carried the ball more than anybody else. But Lyman's got nine carries now today. Not much doing in the running game right there, but the running game has been effective today. There's been 179 yards rushing for the two sides combined in this contest. And I thought you hit on a very interesting point earlier, Ben, when you talked about the perception of the Gus Malzahn offense being a finesse offense. One of the things that he spoke to us about when we had a chance to meet with him yesterday was getting the hard-nosed Auburn edge back. And he has repeated that a number of times, not just to us, but other reporters. That's been one of the focuses, hard-hitting, hard-hitting practices and trying to get back what he refers to as the hard-nosed Auburn edge. Well, they want that. And there's a tremendous amount of physicality to be gained. I mean, it seemed as if Auburn just was not mentally or physically tough in 2012, and they wanted to regain that and make, have that be something that they're known for. They want this football team to be known week in and week out of a very, very physical offensive defensive units. The walk-on wide receiver, B.J. Trimble, was unable to catch that pass, and so the ball will go over. No punts here today. They're marking off the yardage, and now the orange team wearing the white jerseys will go on offense, and the blue team, you see Ellis Johnson standing right there in the middle, will go on defense. Let's check in with Emily Gagnon. She's standing by with Coach Malzahn. 
All right, we're here with Coach Malzahn. What have you seen so far that's impressed you from your team? Well, I like the way our guys are playing. They're flying around. I mean, we've made some mistakes. Some of it's been good, some of it's been bad. But our main thing is our attitude and our approach to the game. And the guys have hustled around. It looks like they've had fun. Talk about both quarterbacks and who's winning the battle so far today. You know, that's a good question. I've seen some good and some bad. You know, it's good. We'll have a chance after it's all said and done to evaluate them. But, uh, you know, there's been some good things. The running backs are kind of playing really well today. Talk about them. Yeah, we're giving some carries. Uh, Lions opening up some uh, some holes right there. There's been some good plays. Been some negative too. Our defense is playing well too. All right, the defense has had some turnovers. Uh, Garrett, yeah. he, you know, he scored that first touchdown. Yeah, that was nice. I think some of those touchdowns got set up by the defense, and uh, especially our first defense flying around. Uh, Coach Johnson done an excellent job with those guys. How do you think your guys are responding to this uh, in-game experience well, with fans finally yeah, here? i tell you what, first of all, hats off to our crowd. Unbelievable crowd, and I really appreciate that. I know our players do, and it's fun to see how they're reacting out here. It's a new era. You keep saying it. How does it feel? It feels great. It feels great, and i uh, got a lot of work to do, but that's the fun part. And what I asked you what impressed you the most. Just tell me one thing that maybe you're like, ooh. Something needs to be done. Yeah, well, our attitude's what impressed me the most. I mean, we made some mistakes, good and bad, but I love our attitude. Thanks so much, Coach. All right, thank you. All right. All right, can, guys. Back yeah, up to you. Thank you, Emily. You can uh, feel the enthusiasm that Gus Malzahn is drawing from this game, his players, and the crowd as well. I thought he hit on a very big point, though. It's going to be difficult for the coaches right here. And, you know, Emily asking the question. He can't answer it either. We can't answer it. They're going to have to go back and really watch the tape. Who was on the field, what personnel was on the field, who you scored the touchdowns against will ultimately determine how effective the quarterbacks and all these players were. Well, just think about the difficulty that you and I are having keeping up with the pace and the tempo of the ball game, calling it from a play-by-play -play perspective. There's no way that these head co the head coach and the assistant coaches can evaluate with the scrutiny that they want to to see who played well. Carry by Wallace, and I thought, and we touched upon this at halftime, Jonathan Wallace out of the two has been the sharper of the two quarterbacks. I would have to agree. He's obviously completion percentage is very good. He's had a couple of touchdowns through the air and made some good plays. You know, obviously the interception, you'd like to take that back. But what you glean from that experience is how he propelled into the rest of the game. Did he, did he go into a shell or did he do some good things afterwards? I thought he really got into a rhythm. They used him on the blue offense, and they used him on the orange offense. And when he got out there and he had back-to-back -back series, uh, and you know had those back-to-backs, he really developed a rhythm, really started to click, and really started to show us some of the things that he showed us at the end of last season under much difficult, much different, and much more difficult circumstances. Jonathan is a very, very capable quarterback. And he's one, and, and really and truly, people that are historians of Auburn football can remember back to Damian Craig wearing number 16. Just a gritty, tough, hard-nosed football player that can make plays and has the intangibles to be successful. Third down and four. Handoff to Cameron Artis Payne, and he's going to be stopped shy of the first down. Payne of over 100 yards rushing in this game. Payne, as we have alluded to a number of times in this game, Ben, is a very interesting story in that he's from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania High School, and we'll tell that story when we get back. Thirty five fourteen the orange leading the blue here at a packed house at Jordan Hare Stadium. We were talking about Cameron Artis Payne as we went to time out there. He you know basically only played one year of high school football his senior year when the coach knocked on his door and said would you come play football. He was a point guard in high school played one year at Milford New York prep and then went back home for two years did not play at all basically just worked out every day before he got an opportunity to play junior college football it was there that the stage was set for him to get big time offers. Well I think that translates and tells you what type of athlete this young man is to be able to stay out of the game and come back in and have this type of success that he had at the junior college level and essentially turn into the number one junior college running back in the country. You see today 104 yards rushing 47 yards receiving for 152. The pass yardage being pass receiving yardage. He hasn't thrown any passes but 152 total offense for a CAP. Frazier on the handoff. Number 42 Cameron Shakespeare on the carry. 
Cameron Shakespeare, Chandler, I'm sorry, Chandler Shakespeare getting the first care of the day for him. He won't find his name on the depth chart, but he's big in the English department. Sorry. Tried on that one. Second down and 10. He'll get another carry right here. Shakespeare, the ball carrier. Tackle the line number 15, Joshua Holson. You see the crowd right there. Man, it is. They had 28,000 tickets pre sold. They are triple that number, maybe. It is a big crowd. It's you not know, quite triple that number, but it is a big number here today. Obviously, we see the upper deck across the field from us and not being able to see the upper deck just above us. You've got to. You've got to guess that there's, there's 60,000 plus here. Sammy Coates makes the grab after Joshua Holsey, the safety slash cornerback, fell down. Look here, it, it turns into just a simple one-on-one -on -one between Holsey and Coates. Coates makes a good play on the football. That's the, that's the thing that he struggled with last year, being able to make mid-air adjustments on the ball, whether it was a great throw or a poor throw. In this situation, it's a completion. Frazier to the air, fires to the opposite side, and that is a completion to Lewis. Ricardo Lewis has made his fifth catch of the game. One big thing to take away from that in itself is two completions by Kyle Frazier, but he had Craig Sanders right in his face. To be able to make that throw under the rest is a, is, a, is a good play for Kyle and one you hope he builds on. Second down and two. Ball at the 22-yard line for the blue offense. Nothing doing on that play. Shakespeare got nailed at the line of scrimmage. You know, one thing, Matt, that people are going to hear Gus Malzahn mention a lot of times is, is, is schedule, staying on schedule offensively. You know, when had to have a, a pickup of eight on first down, you turn to second and two. The, there's a plethora of offensive plays that you can run. It really keeps the defense on its toes. Even at third and three, third and four, it's a manageable down that you can convert on. Ball at the 24-yard line, a speed sweep to Ricardo Lewis. That's a play that we've seen run a number of times. Lewis and Quan Bray running that play. And Lewis comes up short of the first down. You know, Matt, whomever is in that role on the offensive side of the football that Ricardo takes this jet sweep on, it has to be someone that the opposing defense is in fear of. Ontario McCaleb was that guy for the last few seasons for the Tigers. It has to be a guy that's dangerous because whether or not he gets the ball, there's going to be a tremendous amount of play action and things that determine the success of this offense. Cody Parkey will attempt a 39-yard field goal. Missed on a 46-yarder earlier and has missed on a 39-yarder. So Cody Parkey, uh, who was very reliable kicking a year ago, missed only three field goals the entire season and came in having hit 75% of his field goals in his career, fourth on the all-time list, has missed twice here today. Here's a look at the Auburn 2013 schedule. It will begin out of conference with Washington State on August 31st. The SEC opener will come two weeks later against Mississippi State. Well, obviously Mississippi State coming off an 8-5 season. The biggest thing to take away from the 2013 schedule is the home schedule for this year. They've got eight home games. They finish in the middle of, excuse me, in the middle of that, you obviously have LSU, Ole Miss, Western Carolina. Then they travel to College Station. But the biggest thing to take away is the finish of the season, the two big games, the biggest rivals between Georgia and Alabama, both here at Jordan Hill. Yeah, five of the first six games will be at home. The only road game out of the first six will be a formidable one as they play at LSU. But a good chance, perhaps, for Gus Malzahn to build some momentum 
we talked as we looked at the 2012 results how Auburn was unable to build any momentum. A couple of cl close losses perhaps really set them back for the course of the season. Perhaps Malzahn can reverse that by getting some wins early at home. Absolutely. It, it, you, you, made, you hit the nail on the head. Momentum is key for this 2013 squad. Second down and 10. Handoff goes to Lyman. Here's a comparable of the Auburn offense, the Arkansas State offense. Of course, we compare them with Arkansas State because Malzahn, the head coach there, and Lashley was the OC. You see a significant difference, of course, a significant difference in the level of competition as well. But just the flat out numbers were vastly greater for Arkansas State. And of course, Malzahn was able to do those same type of things in his three seasons as the OC here at Auburn before taking that Arkansas State job. And I, the one common opponent was Louisiana Monroe, which Auburn beat in overtime, but you see the comparables from that game. Well, and you go back and then you, you made a good comment. I think the biggest comparable is the success offensively that Gus had while he was here on the Plains as the offensive coordinator. Up until this point, from a statistical standpoint, with Chris Todd at the helm, guys, a guy that you know just was not blessed with a lot of God-given athletic talent, offensively and statistically, they put up better numbers even than when Cam was here. So it's a lot of potential offensively for under Gus Malzahn. That's the end of the third quarter. Orange leads the blue 35-14 as we head to the final 12 minutes of the Auburn A-Day game on CSS. You're watching the 2013 Auburn A-Day game brought to, brought to you by Cook's Pest Control. Orange leading the blue, 35-14. Matt Stewart, Ben Leard, and Emily Gagnon with you at Jordan-Hare Stadium. And the largest crowd ever to see a spring football game at Auburn University today. 83,401 the attendance. That by far, Matt, exceeds expectations. Just a, just a sensational showing by the Auburn family coming in and supporting these kids after last season, new head coach, new coaching staff. It, it is a, it's a tremendous sight to see right now. I think out of all the numbers that we've seen here today, quarterback, Cameron Artis Payne running the ball, the 49 points that have been scored, the biggest number that stands out from the Auburn A-Day game is the 83-401. Without a doubt. Because that says that the Auburn football program, at least the fans believe, They've made the right decision, and the program's moving in the right direction. Absolutely. The, the support is there. The support's always been there. It's just a matter of the, the fans having the ability to show that, and this is the way they do so, is come to the spring football game and support these players in any way, shape, form, or fashion that they can. And let's face it, we showed the comparables of the numbers for Arkansas State under Gus Malzahn and Auburn last year. Malzahn was hired because of what he did the first time he was here at Auburn, not what he did last year. But what he did last year was just affirmation that the guy can coach. He took over that program. They went nine and three. You know, he took over a pretty good program, by the way. Uh, went nine and three, won the Sun Belt. But the big key was that he had been here before he had been part of the championship here before. And as he said, he's recruited a lot of the guys. A lot of the guys, we talk about a new day. It is a new day because he's the head coach. But a lot of the guys that are still in this program, he and Lashley had a big part in recruiting. They did. They had a big part in recruiting. And I think his experience here in Auburn from a play calling and X's and O's perspective allowed Jay Jacobs and the hiring committee to be able to see that he can execute that. But from a managerial perspective of an overall program, Coach Mazan will tell you that he learned so much of the intricacies of being a head coach and having your hands in everything, not just calling plays and setting an offensive game plan. Last year at Arkansas State, which obviously will be deemed successful for him here. That was a pretty good catch right there by Ricardo Lewis.
Ricardo Lewis has had a pretty big day. Seven catches for the blue. And he's had one for the orange. So a total of eight catches today for Lewis. Not a lot of yards. Eight catches for 66 yards. Not bad. But most of his work has come in the uh, intermediate short yardage passing. Game. Well, you're going to have eight catches for 66 yards. And, and the goal of having him touch the football so often is to turn one of those five yard hitch catches into a 75 yard touchdown pass, which in turn pads your stats just a little bit. Second down and 11. Clock is running here. Under nine and a half minutes to play in the Auburn A Day game. After this game, a lot of the 83,000, although I'm not quite sure how they're going to fit them all there at Toomer's Corner. But the 83,000 will head over. The pass was intended for Trimble. will head to Toomer's Corner. They're going to roll the trees for one final time before they take the trees down. The trees, of course, as you know, the story were poisoned. They have died. They're having to take them down. They're going to do that on Monday, I believe. They're going to let the toilet tissue stay on the trees all day tomorrow. In fact, they've actually pushed it back a little bit. They're going to let going to stay there until 7 p.m. tomorrow to let the effect last in. And then they're going to announce plans for what they're going to do there at the corner in the future. Well, it's just an unfortunate situation that it, that it comes to that. But, you know, obviously part of this 83,000 uh, is going to exceed the expectations. Earlier in the week, there was an only expectation of about 10,000 people being there. But just take, for example, for 50% of the people that make the 400-yard yep. walk the Tumor's Corner, it will be an unbelievable spectacle to see. Pass intended for Coach right there. Joshua Holsey was running the coverage to, on the previous attempt to uh, Coach. Holsey fell down, and Coach made the grab that time. Holsey was running step for step with him. As you take a look at your Cook's pest control, thorough inspection for this game, Quarterbacks have been efficient in a, in particular Wallace artist Payne strong running game today over 100 yards rushing and Garrett playing the star backer position has shown signs that he's going to be a star at that position. Well, you know, obviously being efficient runs parallel to consistency and those guys have done some good things and some bad things or poor things. But I would say that over overall they've been efficient. Call cooks for a free pest and termite evaluation. 7.48 to play with the orange leading the blue, 35-14. The Auburn A-Day game has been brought to you by Cook's Pest Control. Upgrade your home's termite protection to the unbeatable combination, Cook's Pest Control and the Centricon system. Call Cook's for a free pest and termite evaluation. And by third ship Amber Lager, when beer is your calling, you never clock out. Orange leading the blue 35 14 with 748 to play. Here in the fourth quarter, Matt Stewart, Ben Leard, and Lee Gagnon with you at Jordan Hare Stadium where a record crowd has showed up to watch today's ball game. Frazier to the air, fires, and Fultz, the intended receiver, the tight end. Now, the quarterback battle, we said off the top, Brett Lashley, Gus Malzahn have told us the same, is not going to be decided today, but certainly today is a big evaluation period. The quarterback battle will continue in the summer when Nick Marshall, the junior college transfer, who originally signed with Georgia, played at Georgia for a year, went to junior college, played dual threat quarterback slash athlete there. And then Jeremy Johnson from Montgomery Carver will arrive, and they'll be a part of the battle. How realistic do you think it is for those guys to arrive in the summer, basically get four weeks of practice before the season opener, and legitimately be in the quarterback race? Well, given the situation Auburn is in right now at the quarterback position, it, it's, it's very realistic. The, these kids can be under the impression that they will have the opportunity to be the starting quarterback in that first game for the Auburn Tigers. Cameron Artis Payne with another carry. Stop by number 97, Reed Brooks. So a first and 10 for the Orange team. Six 
CAP gets another carry. Jeremy Johnson is a guy that I've been very intrigued with. In fact, he made our CSS all in the huddle team for our recruiting show the past couple of years. You saw him play right here on CSS for Montgomery Carver High School. Tremendously gifted athlete. Showed a little Cam Newton in him when we saw him back in the fall. But his big thing, he has great running ability, but his big thing is his arm. Well, he can throw the ball extremely well. He's a very accurate passer. Probably about six foot six, 240, 250 pounds. A phenomenal athlete, can play basketball very well also. But one of the things that impressed me the most about this young man is that he maintained his commitment to Auburn, even with all the situation that was going on. And he in turn helped tremendously in maintaining this big signing class. Certainly will be interesting once Jeremy Johnson and the rest of those prospects arrive on campus. Carl Lawson got a chance to visit with him several times on our recruiting show in the huddle leading up to National Signing Day and then again on National Signing Day. Very impressed with him. I think he's going to be a big time star. Ellis Johnson feels like Carl Lawson's going to be a big time star. And I think Carl Lawson and Elijah Daniel are a couple of guys given the importance of the defensive end position in this uh, Auburn defense and the need for impact players there are going to get a chance to maybe contribute right away. Well, I fully expect both of these young men to play and play a significant role for the defensive side of the football in Ellis Johnson's defense this season. They will have very, very prominent careers. And to be quite honest with you, if each of these young men live up to their expectations, they will have a short career here on the Plains. Carl Lawson, one of the incoming signees that will arrive this summer and begin participating in drills leading up to the start of the 2013 season. CSS is proud to introduce the gold medal winning third shift Amber Lager from a band of brewers whose passion didn't end when the day shift did. Third shift, when beer is your calling, you never clock out. Third shift is proud to sponsor today's Auburn A-Day game. Tailgating at the spring football game, only in the SEC. It does not get any more passionate than that. Three fifty to go. Tate O'Connor now in there at quarterback. There's two walk-on quarterbacks on the roster. Tate O'Connor getting his first chance, and Ben Duran being the other. That's Ben Duran who's in there right now, number seventeen. Duran, a 6'3", 200-pound sophomore out of uh, Massachusetts, near the Boston area, no doubt the events of this past week impacting him as he was practicing here at Auburn. Let's check in with Emily Gagnon. Hey guys, even though today is the spring game and while a lot of colleges finish while this, when this game is over, it's actually not over for the Tigers. They have two practices to make up. So after today's game, co coach and his players will look over film and they have two more practices next week to talk about all the things that went right, that went wrong, what they have to clean up. So it's not over after today. Thank you, Emily. Pass was nearly intercepted. Georgia had a similar circumstance, and I think you see more programs doing that, Ben, because this is such a big evaluation game. You're able to get in there, look at the film, and maybe go in for one final or one or two practice to kind of, as Emily said, clean things up. Well, that's what they want to do. They want to look at the film and evaluate. They don't want a two- or three-month gap to be between the spring game and when you're able to put pads back on in the fall. That's a, it's something that most programs, like you mentioned, Matt, are going to to have one or two practices. Now, I will tell you this. One of the areas that Coach Malzahn and any head coach will want, and they'll be able to determine the dedication and the attitude of these kids, is how much effort they put out in these remaining two practices, even after the spectacle that is A-Day. Auburn would like to thank Golden Flake for their title sponsorship of today's game. Golden Flake, the official snack, of the Auburn Tigers for over 50 years. So the orange team goes back on offense, perhaps for the final time as we're now under two minutes to play on the clock. Lyman on the carry again. Patrick Lyman, the ball carrier. Brought down by number 46, Ricky Parks. Montravius Adams is the highest rated prospect in the signing class. In fact, he was the number two 
ranked player in the country behind Robert Kimdichie, who signed with the Ole Miss Rebels. Interesting thing about Montrevious Adams is Auburn is very deep at defensive tackle. Even though he's the highest ranked player in the recruiting class, he might be less likely to get on the field as much as Carl Lawson or Elijah Daniels. Well, and he was a big surprise pickup to the Auburn family in, in his commitment to the Tigers. He was obviously a guy that everyone expected him to go play in Athens for the University of Georgia and Coach Mark Rick. But this is one guy that we are glad to have on the Plains or keep coming to the Plains because he will be a tremendous, tremendously impactful player for the Tigers. Another carry there by Lyman, and now some uh, big hit down there on the field by Ladarius Owens. Rodney Garner, you mentioned the Georgia connection, and Rodney Garner changing from Georgia to Auburn, taking a job now with his alma mater, and perhaps a big reason why Montrevious Adams ended, the, uh, ended up ultimately signing with the Auburn Tigers. And that was probably the final play of the A-Day game right there. So now comes the process, Ben, of the evaluation of game film, figure out who did what and against who. But overall, we know the Orange team beat the Blue today, 35-14. Jonathan Wallace, I thought, was more efficient, sharper than Kyle Frazier. How that plays out, what that means for the quarterback battle remains to be seen. And Cameron Artis Payne has emerged as a guy that is going to be a factor in the running game. I think the thing that you saw from Cameron Artis Payne or what Gus Malzahn expects from him, he is going to be an absolute workhorse. But from Frazier and Wallace's standpoint, I totally agree with you. I think Jonathan Wallace was a little bit more consistent, more efficient. But you definitely walk away from this game and see that there's areas for improvement on both sides. I thought the other big number here today was the attendance number because more than anything that happened on the field, that shows that indeed not only is Gus Malzahn saying it's a new day, but the fan base is acknowledging that it's a new day. Absolutely. The support is there. The Auburn family stays all in at all times, and I think it's evident today with the 83,000 fans. Defensively, that's going to be a little bit harder to judge because of the way the personnel was used and in what capacity they were used. But, uh, you know, Justin Garrett, we know, is going to be a guy that's going to be very important to what they do defensively uh, over the course of the season and scored a touchdown early. But other than that, maybe he had a hit or two. But it was hard to, you know, without looking at film to know exactly how he played today. Well, once again, that's the spring game at its best. You really don't know. Everything's a moving target, especially defensively, to be able to see and determine who plays well and who has some area for improvement. Jonathan Wallace, as we mentioned, uh, 18 completions on 26 attempts in the ball game and 191 yards to the air and a couple of touchdowns. Well, you, you got it. You got to tip your hat the way Jonathan played today. There's been a lot of a lot of pessimism surrounding the quarterback play throughout this spring, but I think overall you'd have to give him a passing grade, of course, with throwing a couple of touchdown passes doing very well from a completion percentage standpoint and executing. The only aspect of his play today was taking away that interception. That's one play you obviously ask him. He'll probably dwell on that more so than even the touchdowns. Cameron Artis Payne was a guy that uh, Auburn fans had read about in spring practice. Now they've had a chance to see him in action. 18 carries for 117 yards today. And he also was uh, big in the passing game, had a couple of receptions for 47 yards. Well, Cameron Artis playing the new guy to the Auburn uniform of the Auburn Tigers. He will be a workhorse. I think you can take that away from his performance today, but there'll be a lot of things expected, to him, expected of him in the blocking game, in the running game, and the passing game. And also, uh, we, we've talked about incoming players, Jonathan Ford and Peyton Barber are a couple of running backs that will be in the mix when summer comes as well. No doubt that the incoming freshmen will be given chances to play, chances to excel, and hopefully they live up to those expectations. So let's go down to the field now to Emily. Coach Malzahn, it's over with. You can breathe a sigh of relief. Tell me about today and how you feel. Well, first of all, you know, what stood out to me is our fans. We got the best fans of college football, 80,000 80, plus to see a spring game. Says a lot. I know I know our players and coaches really appreciate that. Now you keep talking about the fans. How impressed are you with this crowd? It's blowing me away. Yeah, it blew me away too, and that was one of the highlights of the day. You know, our guys, they responded well. 
the way they responded to adversity and some good things. And that's really what I was looking for from my player standpoint. Thanks so much, Coach. All right, guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Emily. So the orange team beats the blue team here today, 35-14 the final as Gus Malzahn has coached his first game for the Auburn Tigers. And they'll walk out of here with a win, and then they'll do some evaluation of the uh, game film here in the uh, coming days to sort it all out and perhaps have a depth chart by the end of their two spring practices next week. Orange beats the blue, 35-14 is the final. Coming up next, SEC baseball, Vanderbilt will be at Georgia. That's coming up at the top of the hour. And now for Ben Lear, Emily Gagnon, and the entire CSS team, I'm Matt Stewart, so long from Auburn.